Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. I'm Stacy Wang, Senior Marketing Manager at Rivet Logic. Today we're presenting Accelerating Your Digital Transformation with Design Thinking. In this webinar, we'll talk about why the vast majority of digital transformation initiatives fail, what you can do to prevent this, and how to utilize design thinking to accelerate your digital transformation success. I'd like to welcome our presenter, Jason Cranford Teague. Jason is the UX lead at Rivet Logic and a creative strategist, writer, and speaker with over 20 years of industry experience. He has authored numerous books and articles about digital design and has worked with clients including Virgin Group, Capital One, and Marriott International. If you have any questions during the event, please enter them into the Q&A or chat box and we'll cover them during the Q&A session at the end. And this webinar will also be recorded and available on demand afterwards. Um, and now I'm going to hand things over to Jason. All right. Hey, thanks, Stacy. Uh, thank you all for being here. And uh, as Stacy said, we're going to be talking about how you can accelerate your digital transformation uh, with design thinking. Um, I've been doing really digital transformation for at least the last 25 years. Uh, Back when the web was first getting started, we were looking at ways that people could better integrate these new communication platforms into their, into their businesses and, and into their work. Um, and so over the years, I've, I've written a, a number of books and, and published papers on the topic. Um, and over time, my thinking has always been changing and growing and transforming along with the industry. Um, today, in the next 45 minutes, what I want to talk to you about is why do projects fail? So let's start with what's not working. Uh, then what it design thinking is and how it uh, works with digital transformation. We're also going to be looking at a specific kind of digital thinking uh, implementation called design sprints. Then we'll talk about uh, design thinking for digital transformation. And then look at a case study with the IRS where I help them uh, do th through a digital transformation of their uh, online payment system. So, and, and then finally, we'll end with your questions. Um, the fact is that the way people work is changing. Uh, that's true of both the people who use your products and the, your employees themselves. And a digital transformation has to be about moving from yesterday when people received rather static news. It came um, after, much after the fact, uh, sometimes a day or more after. And now we're always on. We always have access to the latest information. And anybody who's had to step away from their computer or their, their uh, communication device for too long knows how um, you start reaching for it because you're like, oh, I need to look that up. I need to look this up. And that is a really new way in which we approach it approach information and knowledge. Eventually, we may even be able to get to the point where the knowledge is not just at your fingertips, but there as soon as you need it, ready to go, predictively uh, helping you solve problems, oftentimes problems you may not even know you, you had yet. So the way we approach design has to change along with that. It's not just enough to try and shoehorn old, um, new technologies onto old ways of thinking. We have to rethink the way we are working with these new technologies. But a lot of digital transformations flounder or fail. They um, get stuck. They don't return the investment as, in, as expected. Michael Gale in Forbes magazine, um, in the Forbes magazine article, why 84% of companies fail at that digital transformation said, if you can't get the sum of the parts to be greater than the cost, you're going to fail. And I think a large part of the 84% that fail, it's because they're not prepared to change behavior. They think they can have strategy and technology, and it just doesn't get them there fast enough or in a good enough way. So what we need to figure out how do we change that thinking. Um, so how many companies rate their digital transition as very effective? Well, it's not a lot. Uh, only 18% rate it as very effective, 63% moderately effective, with 19% not effective at all. 
This is because we tend to think in terms of waterfall development methodology, and waterfall simply doesn't work. You know, you go through your, your five steps, you discover, and then you define the problems, and then you have designers go off and design it, and they pitch that over to the developers who then build it and then deploy. But what invariably happens is um, scope creep where changing circumstances, changing realities, and changing needs come about during the waterfall process that increase the amount of time it takes, changes the needs, changes the desired outcome, and this pushes budgets and time limits until uh, projects run over time and run over budget. So how do we get them to succeed? Well, Every project fails in a different way. No two projects fail in exactly the same manner. So rather than looking at why they're failing, let's look at how we can make sure that they succeed. The first bedrock of every successful project is to clearly define the needs, not just what the requirements are, not just what the technology is being used, but what do the people who will be using the product truly need to get their, uh, to get their work done. Then clearly define what success looks like. So we have the needs, and then we want to clearly define what it is that a successful outcome will look like. And that's not just goals. Goals simply state what you hope to achieve. But for example, if you're creating a travel product, what does a successful use of that travel product look like? Possibly people having happy vacations. That is a successful outcome. Now, the goal might be that they register for a hotel, they register for their plane travel, so forth and so on. But the real outcome you want is to have a good vacation. Next, you want to clearly define the technologies to be deployed. Um, all too often, we the, the developers know exactly what technology is going to be used. And even the product managers or project managers know what technology is going to be used. But it's vital that everybody within the team, and that includes the designers, understand the technology to be used. Many projects get derailed because the designers create products that then can't be realized in the technology that's available. You also want to involve the users in decision making. Now, this is a, a, a weird concept for a lot of people because the users are the people we're creating for, but they're the ones with all the answers to what they need and what success looks like. So rather than simply uh, doing some front end research on them and then user testing later on, what you want to do is try and bring them in at every step along the way to validate the work you're doing and make sure you're on the right path. You want to make user testing part of the process, not an afterthought. So go along with involving users in the decision making. You want to make sure that you test with users regularly, working prototypes and products that they can give you feedback on. And finally, you want to design and develop in steps, not in waterfall, not in great big chunks, but you want to develop, design and develop a step at a time. And uh, this is the, the radical new thinking that uh, design thinking, and especially as we'll discuss, design sprints brings to our process. Rather than having everything designed up front and then developed second, we work interlevered with developers to make sure that we get one thing right and then we move on to the next thing. And we iterate around to bring uh, new developments, our, new findings and new ideas in at any stage in the process. Now, for developers, this step-by-step -step, uh, process is the agile methodology, which makes use of development sprints. Two, generally two weeks of intense development on a single item, a single idea, or a single feature or functionality within the product being created. Designers have been reluctant to embrace this type of methodology, though, but in recent years, design thinking has become a popular way of allowing designers to work more directly with developers 
in, in an agile methodology. And the recent development of the idea of design sprints takes that one step further, allowing designers to, to work on very focused features and functionality rather than trying to design the, all, the entire thing at once. So let's talk about the design thinking process and how it works. So design thinking um, has been around actually for decades, but it has recently had a um, renaissance in the digital design environment uh, led by people like Nigel Cross, who is a design studies at the Open University in the UK. And what he says is that everyone can and does design. We all design when we plan for something new to happen, whether that might be a new version of a recipe, a new arrangement of the living room furniture, or a new lay uh, tour of a, a layout of a personal web page. So design thinking is something inherent within human cognition. It is part of what makes us human. And this has been a, a really interesting debate in the design community. Um, on Twitter a few weeks ago, as a matter of fact, there was a huge um, debate uh, around this idea of everyone is a designer. And it's something I firmly believe, I agree with Nigel, that everyone has some form of design that they do on a daily basis. We think in design, whether it's planning you know, how we're going to get from one place to another, how we're going to put together an email, all sorts of things we don't think about as design are really our design brain working with us. There are a lot of designers, though, who feel that design is a practice and something that is a skill that only a certain number of people have. I believe that, yes, design is a skill, but it is a skill that is a human skill that we all have. Some people have practiced it more than others. Some people have trained more than others. Um, anybody can throw a ball, but not everybody is Michael, uh, Michael Jordan. So for design thinking, how it addresses the, the success factors that we mentioned before was that it first clearly defines the user needs, clearly defines what success looks like, both from a user standpoint and from a business standpoint and from a technology standpoint, and clearly defines the technologies to be deployed. We talk about this validation Venn diagram where we talk where we want to find what people desire, whether it's viable for the business, and then whether it's feasible technologically, and that's where we find our best solutions. When we veer outside of that, that's where we find pro projects going off the rails. It's also important that it is human-centered. We involve the users in decision-making. We allow them to help, uh, we guide the users to help us find the best solutions to their problems. Um, and, then we, and then part of design thinking is that we are constantly testing our ideas and validating them against uh, that, those user needs. So design thinking is really about going from need to launch. How do we get from the need to the launch? And that solution is what the design thinking is in between. All too often, though, in projects, I see that the designers, the developers, and the project managers want to jump into finding the solution before they've really identified the need and the optimal outcome. And, and this is also another way to ensure the failure of a project, because rather than building based on needs and optimal outcome, you're building based on your assumptions about what, um, what is going to be a successful product. So the design thinking process that we use at Rivet Logic um, looks like this. It's an iterative project where each of these steps along the way uh, is not standalone. We may revisit any of these at any time in order to validate what we're doing and ensure that we're getting the best solution. Um, it starts, though, by identifying the user needs as carefully as possible. We research the users, uh, creating personas, create, interviewing them, and really nailing down exactly what is going to uh, be needed to create a successful outcome. We 
use that to define how we're going to move forward with the solution. And we use storytelling throughout that because humans are natural storytellers as well. We like to tell stories. As soon as you start telling somebody a story, they're going to pay a lot more attention to you than if you simply give them dry facts. So we use several different uh, easy to understand storytelling techniques to help get the ideas out there. And that's the middle step, ideation, where we come up with the, the ideas based on our research, based on our definition, and based on the stories that we have def, uh, defined previously. And then we move into uh, my favorite part, which is the prototyping step. This is where we start to build the solution. But rather than using uh, traditional methods like wireframes and site maps and um, visual comps, we actually start to build as close to a living working product as we possibly can as quickly as possible. So we're not bogged down with maybe trying to connect um, all of the data sources and all of the back end code. But what we're trying to do is create a front end that we can then test with as many users as possible to get their feedback. And showing somebody a static image of a page is not nearly as effective as sitting them down and saying, okay, click around, how would you do this, and having them actually click step by step going through the process. We're then, once we've validated that, we're ready to start that build process towards getting to launch. So, first we start with needs and research. We look at the user and business needs. We ask ourselves, who is this for and what are they like? We then research uh, people's desires, their needs, um, ask them, what, what do you need to get done? What is it that you actually need to get done? Then we research business viability. Is this something that we can build and get a return on investment for? Is it something that is actually going to make our business stronger? Then we research technical feasibility. How can we make it happen? Do we have the technology? Do we need to, um, do we need to pull back our expectations? Or do we need to push the technology as it is there, as it exists now? Next, we deconstruct um, the, the problem uh, with the research, telling stories, defining, and ideating. So we, uh, we look at the tech to be deployed. What tools can we use? We look at the big ideas and goals. I, I talk a lot about big ideas when I'm, I'm doing design thinking workshop because really those big ideas, those are the, the, the beacons, the lighthouses that we always want to keep our eye on when we're doing design. It's what grounds us to make sure that every decision we make feeds back into those, those big ideas and goals. Then we start telling job stories. What are the tasks that the user will perform? So we start getting more into the weeds. We start thinking more about, okay, how is this going to be achieved? And then we move on to doing uh, what are called journey maps. And journey maps are uh, an uh, interesting way of displaying the process through which people will, will use our project, but also taking into account not just the process, but what people's emotional state is likely to be like during the process. That's something that's not oftentimes thought of. Are they going to be um, anxious about starting this process. Uh, for example, if it was a travel website, I'm always very anxious when I start using a travel website because I'm, I'm paranoid that I'm going to get the wrong date, for example, that I accidentally put in the 14th as my departure date when I actually meant, meant the 15th. And I'm paranoid because that's actually happened to me a couple of times in my life. And then you've got to pay extra money to get the ticket changed and so forth and so on. And so looking at that emotional state helps us see opportunities that we can, um, we might use to make the process better, to make the process flow better for the user. Then we begin to construct our solution. Again, we use storytelling, this time using a tool called storyboards. Uh, now, if you're familiar with uh, filmmaking, you know that storyboards are used for everything from TV shows to movies to commercials to break down part by part exactly what each scene is going to look like. Well, for 
product development, we use that to break down step by step what the user is going to be doing in each step. Now, sometimes this can be the screen they're looking at. Sometimes this can be where they are located or what they are thinking about. It's a free-flowing tool we use to help us better understand exactly the situation and context that people will find themselves in while using the product. We then ideate using user flows, which help us then get a little bit more technically granular as to exactly you know, which button is clicked, which screen is revealed, uh, and how people move through the system. We then prototype, prototype using interactive and visual design. How do the steps in the path work and look? This is where we really begin to see and feel the solution that we're working on, and then we can take that to user testing. Are we on the right path? Is this what's going to work? So we're constantly validating everything we're doing to make sure that we're on the right path to a successful product. Then we build and launch. Now, I'm not talking a lot about build, uh, build in, in this pro, pro, in this. Uh, talk right now. Obviously, there's a lot more to building than just saying, well, let's go build it. Uh, but the developers have their own processes for doing that. It's enough that designers work with the developers in that process to make sure that what gets built is what was desired and what was envisioned uh, early on. We then do more testing more usability testing. Is this actual product, the one that we're going to put out right? Do we need to do any more refinement? Did we miss anything? And then finally, we're ready to launch. But it's not over then. We also want to iterate. How can we build on our successful ideas? What can we do better? How can we refine the project to make it even better? And that's where design sprints uh, oftentimes come into the picture. We can quickly look at features and functionality and move through ideas and get things working as quickly as possible. So how does design thinking accelerate success? Um, Google Ventures came up with the idea of the design sprint. Uh, they're actually just GV now, but it was originally Google Ventures. And the sprint is a five-day process for answering critical business questions through design, prototyping, and testing ideas with customers. Developed at Google Ventures, it's a greatest hits of business strategy, innovation, behavior science, design thinking, and more packaged into a battle-tested process that any team can use. It's used by organizations both very large and very small. Um, I've seen it used, uh, it was developed at Google. I have used it when I was working at Capital One, and I've helped the IRS uh, with use design thinking and design sprints to solve some of their problems. Um, and the basic idea at the core of design sprints is to come up with ideas and then test before you build. Make sure that everything is right before you start building, but to do so in as quick a process as possible so that you don't hold up development. For uh, Ripple Logic, we created our own way of approaching design sprints for actual product development. And we begin with a kickoff design thinking workshop. And this is a mini version of the design thinking process where we quickly define, ideate, and tell stories to develop what are called job stories. And job stories work kind of like requirements, but they're far more focused on the user and human-centered design than most requirements that we see. Um, we define who is this for and what are they like. We consider the technology that will be used to deploy it. We come up with ideas. Ideate is just a fancy word that we have for coming up with ideas uh, to find what success looks like. We tell stories so that we know what the path to success looks like. And then we create the job stories, the tasks that the user will perform. And we come up with as many job stories for the product as we can during that, during that period. 
We then move on to a design dev sprint um, cadence, where we take the job story from the design thinking workshop as designers. We come up with ideas on how to uh, solve for that job story in week one, and then we prototype in week two so that we can create the solution that we can then pass to the developers. While the developers are, are doing their development sprint, we move on to the next job story and begin to come up with ideas and prototype that so that we're constantly filling the development backlog with new work to, um, to create, to develop. Now, it's not enough, though, that we keep this cadence going. The designers and developers have to work closely together such that the developers will have input during the design sprint, looking over things to make sure that the designers aren't building anything that's going to blow up the project. And during the development sprint, the designers are working with the developers in order to ensure that the product is created as intended and as designed. Going back and forth, until we get or until we're ready for our final launch. The design sprint advantages, well, first of all, it was developed by Google Ventures and it has a very good pedigree, so it has a very good pedigree. And as I mentioned, it's used by companies both small and large. It's used regularly by startups and Fortune 500 companies. It targets process, not pages. And what's important about that is rather than thinking about we need to build this page and we need to build this page, it's we need to build this process. We don't need to build a page for, for example, photo uploading. We need to build a process that allows users to upload photos. And that's a very different mindset than thinking in terms of pages and screens. Because with pages and screens, it limits us to thinking, what do we do on this page? With a process, we're thinking, okay, what does a successful um, feature look like? It allows for rapid idea generation, prototyping, and testing. So rather than getting stuck on an idea, we can rapidly come up with ideas and then test them. And then if that's not working, we can come up with more ideas. The key advantage, though, is that it's flexible to respond to changing priorities. Throughout a project, Priorities change, needs change, new information comes in, new, um, new technologies might be found. And when you lock yourself into the traditional waterfall methodology for any type of, of digital transformation, those changes then oftentimes get ignored or pushed to the side or so large that they end up derailing the project. With design sprints and development sprints, you can quickly add new job stories as needed to bring it into the process and, and turn on a dime to uh, account for that. So, and then finally, it involves employees or, or users who are the true subject matter experts in the decision making. It allows them to give us the ideas on what's going to make their uh, job or their um, use of our product easier. And it allows design and dev to iterate the solutions together rather than being siloed. Uh, one of the biggest problems I often encounter in, in, in projects is the siloing of designers and developers, treating them as if they, they're two separate cults that should never talk to each other, and where, where in reality, they should be working closely together in lockstep. So the design sprint um, over the two-week period looks like this. It's a iterative process. So again, we might go through define, ideate, tell stories, prototype, and test all in one sequence, but we always have the freedom to go back. If during our prototype we find that we have missed something or we got something wrong, we can go back to the definition phase and come up with new ideas, tell new stories, and then bring that back into the prototype before we test again. Um, so first we start by defining what are the steps in the path, then ideating, ideating how do we want to follow that path, 
We tell stories and prototype what do the steps in the path look like. We test so we make sure that we get it right, that we're on the right path. And then the solution is what we want to build, um, is what we want to build. Moving into development then, development begins by planning how they're going to build that solution, starting the actual build, doing code reviews to make sure that it is as tight as possible. Uh, one of the things I, I tell I tell people all the time is that when you're talking about user experience, you're not just talking about visual design. User experience is every aspect of a person's interaction with your product and your company. And all too often, um, a really good visual or interactive experience is completely derailed because the development of it was not rock solid. And as a result, it's buggy, it crashes, uh, it's inconsistent, and there are a lot of ways in which uh, developers can ruin a, a, a user's experience. Finally, we want to make sure that we QA this, that we make sure that everything is in place, that all of the pieces are running at top performance. Um, so we use a QA process um, to do code fixes, commit that code, and then do that nightly build where everybody can see the results of, of what has been corrected by QA. So how do we apply design thinking for digital transformation? Well, um, Dan Rome uh, said of design thinking, whoever is best able to describe the problem is the person most likely to solve it. And we take that philosophy to heart when we're talking about design thinking. Again, it gets back to who the people are who are using the product, because they're the ones who are going to tell us what the problem is and even potentially how to solve it. It's also vital, though, that you understand that with design thinking, we're using something called lean UX. We had to create that term lean UX because for, for decades, user experience design was getting very bloated. It was getting very fat. Um, we created pages and pages of wireframes, of visual comps, of site maps, all sorts of documents that we used in hopes that the developers would then use that to build the product. But one of the things, one of the major ways in which my own um, digital transformation came about over the last uh, 10 or 15 years was realizing that these methodologies slowed us down and kept us actually from really designing the best products because they to a solution rather than giving us the versatility and flexibility to quickly change our minds uh, as new information and new ideas arose. So to start with in a digital transformation, we want to make sure that we clearly define the user's names, user's needs, whether that is for a customer, for your employees, um, or for any other audience that you can think of, we want to make sure that we understand that the situation that they're finding themselves in, what is motivating to take an action, and then what they expect as the outcome of that. And these job stories become very informative for decision making down the road. We keep them up and at every um, every decision point that we have, we say, okay, is this fulfilling the job story? Is this uh, going to work in the context or situation that the person finds that, that themselves in? Is this going to appeal to them and motivate them to take the action that, they, that we need them to or that they want to? And is it going to satisfy them at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the process? We oftentimes use uh, something called journey maps as well, which I mentioned earlier. And this looks at the process, not the interface. There's no screen, uh, there's no screen images up here. There's no buttons to click. It's just point by point, how are people going to move through the product? And it also shows their emotional journey. Again, this is something that was un, um, unregarded oftentimes when it came to thinking about the user experience. But it's something that we've found over the years. It's actually critical to understanding why people have um, friction points within a system, why people have um, where, the, uh, where the, the hard parts come with, when using a system. Uh, where the pain points are. And we need to identify those so that we can do whatever we can to help diminish those pain points. 
It also allows a discussion of opportunities then that we can engage the user that we might have overlooked, especially around making the emotional experience uh, more uh, easier for them. We then use storyboards to help tell the story of step-by-step -step how it's going to work. Now, once upon a time, I actually did storyboards as very um, illustrated. I, I went in there with a program like Illustrator or OmniGraph and I drew out every screen, screen by screen, one, two, three, four, five, six. And I, again, that defeated the purpose of Lean UX because what I found was I was spending more time refining these um, these storyboards then I was actually working on the final project. So now what we do with storyboards is simply sketch. They're part of the design thinking workshop exercise where we give out storyboard sheets like this one you see here. And the, um, and the, the, the people who are engaged in the workshop simply sketch out how they think it's going to work. Um, it considers what triggers the action. So we, we want to think, okay, what is it that got the person to want to do this in the first place? And then what the expected result should be. Next, we get a little bit more um, illustrating and a little bit more technical, um, and we define a user flow. Now, this isn't a site map. This is actually showing on a step-by-step -step basis, basis how people move through the process. And this is very vital for ensuring that we haven't overlooked anything. Storyboards are great, but generally they describe what is called the happy path, the path that we want people to move down. But we have to look off the path as well. We have to look in the weeds because that's where most of the pain points happen. That's where people generally run into problems. And by creating a user flow, we can double check and say, okay, have we thought about what happens if they click on this? Have we thought about what happens if um, the, the, the information that they input into a data field isn't uh, valid or not? So it's a, it's a double checking to make sure that we have covered everything that we, we need to cover. Next are the functional prototypes. And this is my favorite part again, as I mentioned. It combines information and architecture, layout, visual design, and, usability, and allows us to use usability testing all in this one interactive design. And unlike you know, creating Photoshop um, comps or Illustrator for creating wireframes, this is something I can show to a customer. This is something I can show to a user, and they don't have to use their imagination to pretend what happens. We can actually show them what happens when they click on a button. Now, it may not be complete. We may only have one article, but when they click on an article um, link, it takes them to the page where they can actually see the article. And we can mimic as much or as little of the interface as we need to get the job done. Finally, uh, another thing that we've introduced is the idea of the design guide. Now, design guides have been tr traditionally the, the redheaded stepchild of every project, where it's something that is left to the last minute, and oftentimes given to a junior designer, and delivered as a static PDF document to the client. And we say no to that. We say we want something that is there from the very beginning, always accurate because it is coming from the code used to generate the prototype and then the code used to generate the actual working product itself. And it is something anybody can access online or anybody who has, uh, who has permission can access online at any time to make sure that what they're designing or what they're developing is in lockstep with the, with the design guide. Um, it also, the, what we're doing at Rivet Logic is we're also introducing features like uh, clickable va values, so that rather than having to remember a color value or having to swipe across and copy it, all you do is click on the color value and it copies it instantly into your clipboard and you can paste it wherever you want it. So, in our last few minutes, let's talk about design thinking and action. Um, I've worked on several design thinking projects over the year, but the one I think is most relevant to this is when I worked with the IRS on a digital transformation for them on online payments. Uh, their online payment system was very um, inadequate when we were doing, and they were looking to transform it using new digital technologies rather than just 
sticking with the rather um, um, uh, the system that they had, which was really just mimicking the old paper-based system that they were using. So I conducted a two-day design thinking workshop with them, where, on the, um, where our goals were to discover the needs and optimal outcomes for the project, define the triggers and expected outcomes for users, ideate to flesh out ways to help users meet these expectations, not just being satisfied with the first solutions we came up with, but re, um, rethinking those, combining them, merging them together to come up with new ideas of thinking. Tell the stories of how the user was going to journey through the process, and then refine that solution into job stories that will serve as project requirements when they are ready to move on to the next step. So day one, or before I even got started, I had to set the stage. I had to help them define the challenge, what exactly they were talking about, recruit teams. We had um, four different teams uh, of four to five people in each team, uh, and each team could work on a different facet of the process or work on the same facet but come up with completely different ideas. Um, I then had to also work on recruiting facilitators to help in each of those groups because each group is, um, is made up of, they were made up of IRS employees with an embedded UX designer in there to help guide them and guide their ideas as they came up with them and gather all the materials, uh, pen, paper, snacks, everything you need so that people didn't have to be leaving, so that, um, for example, with the storyboards, I printed out storyboard sheets for them, everything ready to go so that we could focus on the tasks at, at hand. So day one, we defined and ideated um, around the big idea. Uh, we helped come up with those big ideas. What are the needs and expected outcomes? What, who are we trying to help? Then we sort, sorted the big ideas into groups of common big ideas. Um, some were about ease of use. Some of the big ideas were about security. Some of the big ideas were about communication. So we grouped those together and combined them so that we could narrow down to a smaller set of big ideas that we were really going to tackle. We then took those big ideas to create our initial job stories uh, that talked about what the actions and motivations were for the people who would be using the uh, product. And then we started to brainstorm solutions. We started to think, okay, how, are we, how could we solve for this job story? On day two, they came back and they began by describing the user's journey. After all that thinking yesterday, we sat down and they sketched out what the user journey was going to look like. Once we had that, they then sketched out what the process would look like step by step, sometimes including, you can see in the example here, sometimes using little cartoon characters, sometimes showing the screen, but always thinking about the people who would be using the project, not just, or the product, not just the product itself. We then regrouped, looked at our initial job stories, and we came up with a final set of job stories now that we thoroughly understood the issues uh, to be addressed. Their next steps were that they could then show the ideas to the audience to get feedback. They could show them the storyboards and get initial feedback. They could ideate using their user flows so they could go to that next more technical step of creating the user flows. And then they could start prototyping the interactive and visual design. All of that from just a two-day session working with them. So, uh, We've got about 15 minutes left. I want to say thanks for from Revit Logic. First of all, uh, we are a agency with uh, uh, located around the world. Uh, we have uh, created a number of projects by sector, uh, and are here to talk to you about any of your uh, company's needs, if need be. Uh, we've worked with a lot of top companies over the year and a lot of different um, areas of expertise. Um, these are just a few of them. Um, but um, I want to hear your questions now. And if you want to know more, 
uh, about this. Uh, we just published an article today uh, on the uh, first part of a three-part series of articles about design thinking for digital transformation. If you go to bit.ly slash rl dash digital transformation, you can find the, the part one of the article and look for part two next week and part three the week after that. So what questions, uh, what are your questions for me? Right, thanks, Jason, for the presentation. Um, so yeah, we'll go, we'll go ahead and jump right into the Q&A. Um, our first question is, um, what kind of problems can design thinking be applied to? Well, that's, that's really the great thing about design thinking is, you know, to just be reductive, design thinking means thinking like a designer. It means going from the details to the big picture and going back and forth to make sure that you have that balance right. So in reality, design thinking is used for everything from designing, um, 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 you know, products like uh, design thinking has been used for designing MRI machines, uh, for designing um, for designing cars, for designing websites, for designing um, apps. Um, anything that can be designed, we can apply design thinking to that issue to come up with more iterative and innovative ideas. Okay, great. Uh, next question is. I uh, was confused about when test happens versus build. At the top of workshop, you stated not a lot of time developing wireframes, et cetera, so the user uh, can experience and react to MVP quickly. Later, you stated design, then test, so you can test before you build. Can you please clarify? Right. Well, that gets back to my point about testing at every stage. Testing is not something you do at the beginning and then at the end. Testing is something you do at the beginning, the end, and throughout. Um, so when I said you, you, you test at the beginning and I talked about testing, those are just two points where you would test. You would, but really, don't think of them as points. Think about every time I have an idea, every time I update my, um, my um, prototype, every time I develop a new prototype, that's an opportunity for me to test what I did to get that reality check from the people who will actually be using it before I put it out into the wild, where if I haven't gotten it right by the time I put it in the wild, it's going to cost me a lot more than if I get it right when I'm during the design or development phases. I think, I think that's, if I understood the question correctly? Um, yeah, that definitely helps clarify. Um, our next question is, how can my company begin to integrate design thinking into our project flows? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. The, the issue often comes about is that, well, we've already started our project. Can I bring design thinking in now? Yes, you can, but you have to approach design thinking a little bit differently. It's not easily tacked on to an existing project, but what it can do is be brought in to help clarify any log jam issues, any sticking points in the process that you're at now. It is best if you start design thinking from the very um, initial um, you know, first step of a, a project. Um, bringing it in later is possible, but you have to be more selective about how it's applied. It has to be applied to help loosen uh, um, to help loosen things up and you know, un unstick any sticking points that are already in there. Um, I don't think you would want to bring design sprints into a, an existing project because design sprints really have to be an ongoing, um, an ongoing process. It's not something you can just kind of throw in at the last minute. So, um, so there are a lot of different ways you can bring design thinking into a project, uh, even if one that's already uh, started. Okay, our next question is, why is design thinking more effective than other design methods? Well, design thinking is, is a process. And, and one of the things I think a, a lot of people have had issue with over the years with uh, designers is that we, don't, we never really seem to have much of a set process. Every designer seemed to, to do it their own way. And, um, you know, I had concerns when I first learned about design thinking because to me, design thinking made so much sense because it was kind of the way I was already designing. Um, but I, I didn't have a word for it. It was just 
an iterative process. And I was like, well, I already iterate. I'm much to the consternation of many of my project managers over the years who were like, you can't go back and redesign that now. It's already in development. So when design thinking came along, I was like, this is perfect because this dovetails with the way I think a lot of designers are already working. But what it allows us to do is explain our process to people who aren't designers and helps them understand. And I think that's the key benefit of design thinking over other more nebulous ways of approaching design. Okay, our next question is, um, who participates in the design thinking workshops? Oh, that, that's great. I, I, I try and stress that, but I'm always worried it's not going to come out because the people working in the, participating in the design work, uh, thinking workshop are the people hopefully who will be using the product and the subject matter experts. So it will be the decision makers within your company. It will be the managers within your company. It will be employees within your company who may know your users better than anybody else. Um, it will also hopefully be the people who will be using your product. It's, it's excellent if you can not just invite in um, you know, your employees, but customers as well, who can then have valuable insights into exactly what it is that needs to be built. Now, as I mentioned before, in a design thinking workshop, each of those groups, usually about four or five people made up of, from different areas of users and employees and, and whoever else you want to bring into it, is then led by a facilitator who is a UX professional who helps guide that group to get the best output from that group um, and, and keeping them on target and helping them understand, um, you know, design best practices along the way. Okay, and to kind of, um, you know, follow up on that question, so can um, a design thinking workshop include remote participants? Yes, it can. I find that's generally more difficult um, than, um, than than having it live. My preference is always to be in the room with people because you get much better ideas. Everybody is much more engaged. There's a lot more free flow of conversations, but that's not always possible. So for example, um, we're getting ready to actually do an internal design thinking workshop here at Rivet Logic, and we're using a product called Murally because several of the people who are going to be uh, participating can't be here in person. So we use Murally, which is a virtual whiteboard. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a SaaS, software as a service online. And we set up these different pages as part of the design thinking workshop that we can then all look at wherever you are in the world. And anybody who's in this page can add notes, can make suggestions, can do whatever they want. It's all a big virtual, shared virtual whiteboard. So that's one way to overcome the limitations of uh, remote uh, participating participants in a design workshop. Great. All right. It looks like we just have one last question. Um, the last question is, how do we avoid groupthink and design by committee? Oh, well, yeah, that was actually my biggest worry when I first learned about design thinking. Um, when Because when I first learned about it, you know, it was like, oh, anybody can take a design thinking class and be a design thinker after one week. And that's not really true. Anybody can take design thinking classes, but design thinking is more than just a standalone subject. It's something that, that you're going to get, the more, the more training you've had as a designer, the more you're going to get out of it. But initially, a lot of people were saying, well, this is just design by committee. This is just getting a bunch of people who don't know how to design together and um, getting them in a room and they're going to come up with solutions whether they're good design or not. But that's only if the design thinking workshop is not properly run. That's one of the reasons you bring the facilitator for each group into the design thinking workshop, because that's a professional. That's someone who is trained and thinking about the issues of user experience and visual design and interaction design, who then guides the group. I don't want them to dictate to the group, but guides the group to the best solutions and helps prevent that groupthink mentality or coming up with ideas that simply meet the loudest voice in the room's uh, desires. Okay, thank you so much, Jason. So it looks like we've covered all of our questions. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? Uh, 
I just wanted to mention the the article again. It's the um, it's the um, support of the the talk I just gave. It's on the Rivet Logic blog. Uh, Design Thinking Series One: Why Digital Transformation Projects Fail. Next week we'll be putting out one on design thinking methodology in general, and then the final week will be about design sprints. So look for those articles, and I'd love to hear any feedback that you have, either from the article or from this talk. I'm always looking and iterating to improve my own process. Hey, thank you so much, Jason, and thank you everyone uh, for joining. We really appreciate you uh, being here with us. And um, like Jason said, please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions, and um, we'll hopefully see you next time for our next webinar. Thank you again. Thanks, everybody.